And hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Pumpkin Copter Cast, the only video game show. So today I am joined by two of the fine folks who worked on, you know, one of the the latest, like, you know, video games that I can safely say is like screwed with a part of my brain. I am joined by Mark and James, who worked on, you know, the fabulous point-and-click game Strange Land. Uh, hi. <laughs> hey, uh, this is Mark. Thanks for having us on your show. Thank you for being here. So, um, we'll start. How about we start? Off with you telling my ten of viewers uh, just who the two of you are. Okay, I'll start. Uh, my name is James Panos, and uh, I'm from Greece. And uh, I code, and usually I code, but uh, I'm a game dev from Greece. And I've worked on uh, with Mark on. Uh, Primordia, a point-and-click adventure game, Strangeland, which you already mentioned, and uh, we're working together on Fallen Gods. And um, I'm also working on a project of my own called Carbon Flesh, and I'm also maintaining every single Wajidai game um, in their catalog, uh, making sure it's working correctly and it's being supported. And I've worked on The Cat Lady 2, and I've worked on Mage's Initiation, and I've done music for a game called Crash Crash. And uh, at some point, the day has only 24 hours. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to stop. And uh, hey, I'm Mark Yohalem. I'm in the United States. Uh, I'm the writer and designer on Primordia and Strange Land and Fallen Gods. And in addition to the games that James and I have worked on together. Uh, I also worked as a contractor on Torment, Tides of Numenera, uh, Dragon Age Origins, Kohan 2, Axis and Allies, uh, Warlords 4, Savage 2, and Heroes of New Earth. Uh, and on those, I was just working as a writer. Uh, a little bit of design on mm -hmm. Dragon Age. Okay, and uh, um, how did the two of you first get introduced to like video games? Is this like a thing one can do with your one spare time? Um, so my first introduction to a video game was uh, seeing the glorious screen of Legend of Zelda on a NES that I didn't own. It was a friend's NES. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, he had it like he never had it working, <laughs> and I was like, uh, "Hey, can I can I, can we plug this in?" He goes, "I don't think it still works," uh, um, and we did plug it in, and it took like a bunch of blowing out the the cartridge to make it uh, happen. And uh, from that moment, I was hooked, and I wanted to do nothing else but uh, make something like Zelda. Um, so that's how I got introduced to to the video game world, I guess. Uh, yeah, and uh, you know, I, I'm similar. I was born in 1980, and so the you know Nintendo came out when I was a little kid. Um, we that was where I first started playing video games. Uh, we also um, had an Apple IIc computer that my step-grandfather, who was a NASA engineer, got for me and my brother because uh, he was convinced, rightly so, that every kid should learn how to use a computer in that generation. And he showed me how you could halt the startup of an Apple IIc, and when you did that, you could just program directly into it in BASIC. Um, that was pretty quick BASIC. You, just, you had to still do line numbers and things like that. Um, and immediately, you know, what I started trying to make in it were games, really simple kind of choose your own adventure type games. But um, the kids in the neighborhood and I used to play kind of role playing type games that we called the narration game. 
and I was convinced that there had to be some way that you could make a narration game within uh, a computer programming environment. That was never within my ability as a computer programmer. Uh, James hears me talk about BASIC all the time because whenever oh we have a problem best. with one of our games, I'm like, here's how I would solve it in BASIC. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but basically, you know, no pun intended, from that point onward, um, it became in my, fixed in my head that this was something that could be done. And then in fourth grade, uh, there was an artist whose name was George Masry, who was a classmate of mine, who was really good at drawing Mega Man characters. And so he and I were obsessed with Mega Man 2 and decided we would design Mega Man 3, which had not yet existed. And so that was really the first game design I did. I mean, it was very, very simplistic, drawing maps on, on um, graph paper. And then he would make them into cool looking designs, visual designs. Mm -hmm. But we obviously never went anywhere with that. Uh, I couldn't program it. Uh, neither of us really had any idea what went into making a game. But basically from that point onward, it was just something I really felt a yearning to do um, and more or less continuously was programming games or designing games from, I don't know, age 9 or 10 onward. Okay. And what would you say it was <clears throat> your favorite game and or games growing up? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a loaded question. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of them, I would say. Uh, definitely. Okay. If there's one game I've... I, if, if I could put one game up there, it would be Final Fantasy VI. I think I've basically restarted the game over 200 times seeing the intro because at the time it was like 3D, which, well, it was like Mode 7, which was like the equivalent of 3D, like... Uh, Anyway, but I've, I've seen that intro so many times and I think that uh, established to me the, the perception of, you know, being able to make games means you can actually tell a story in a very cinematic way, even if the medium and the graphics at the time were very limited, like 3D didn't exist and, you know, it was just sprites and pixels. Um, so I would say Final Fantasy VI definitely up there. Chrono Trigger definitely up there. The the entirety of the Zelda, uh, you know, games. Monkey Island for sure. Uh, that was like what got me into wanting to make an adventure game and got me into the AGS forums, which uh, after a while led me to Mark, uh, to working with Mark. Um, there's like so many. Um, but I would say this kind of captures the list. Uh, I have so many games to talk about. It would be like genre specific. Uh, but definitely Final Fantasy VI and JRPGs at the time were like uh, the games I was really drawn into because it was like a progression from, from Zelda, which I love. So that got me into that. And then I had like my point and click phase, I guess. So that's how we got to meet with Mark. Yeah, I, like James, I'd say there's sort of like in different genres. Um, I played a lot of games when I was younger. Um, you know, one for me, the first JRPG was Dragon Warrior. And my brother and I would like trade off playing while one of us would go to soccer practice or baseball practice. The other one would play the game and level up. And so for me, there was always like, community feel for JRPGs that it was something that you did with someone else that was one of the kinds of games that I had wanted to make for a very long time as a result of that and actually my first um, game development job was writing the story for a Game Boy Color RPG called Infinity which finally like 25 years after my work on it looks like it's coming out this year it had a Kickstarter to finish development of it um, Another game that had a really big impact on me when I was young was Star Control 2. Um, it was sort of a progression from Starflight uh, to Starflight 2, the Star Control 2. But it was a series of um, like space opera type adventure or RPG type games. Um, in terms of adventure games, um, Loom was probably the game that had the biggest impact on me. 
and wanting to make one. And then there was a shareware indie adventure game before really anyone was making indie adventure games called Hugo 2 Who Done It, uh, which just some guy had made that game. And the fact that an individual was able to make a game that looked kind of like one of the old EGA Sierra Parser games made me and my friend think we could do that. And so we then spent four years trying to make adventure games. We made a couple text adventures and did a little bit of work on a graphical adventure. And like James, you know, I don't know, when you fall in love with a game and and you start dreaming about making it, it's hard to ever give up on that dream. And so, you know, years later when we had the opportunity to make Primordia together, that really was this really cool sort of culmination of the kind of game I'd wanted to make and I'd loved growing up. Okay, and what would you say is your favorite game and or games now? Oh, okay. Well, uh, here comes a, <laughs> a big story, I guess. So this year I played Cyberpunk. I didn't play it on release. Mm -hmm. I played it when it, uh, like now. I was really excited when I saw the old trailer that they had. I was like, oh, this game is going to be awesome. It's like so great. And uh, I saw the reviews on, uh, on you know, when it came out and it, people said it was unfinished. It's a shame because I was like such a huge fan coming uh, out of Witcher 3. And I was like, CD Projekt can do no wrong. And so that that didn't. I I was really disappointed. Never tried it on release. But this year I was like, you know what? Maybe maybe you know I I gotta give it a shot. And it's one of my favorite games ever. I think I've suggested it to like everybody I know to Mark a few times. It's a it's a great game. I've enjoyed it very much. Uh, right now I'm playing uh, Dread Delusion which is a Morrowind meets Paradise Killer meets Ocarina of Time. It's like open world Zelda in a, in, a, in, a, in a weird way, but it feels like Morrowind, but there is no depth in the combat system much, which is fine. That's not the point of the game, but it's really good. I'm enjoying it very much. Um, I've played Anno Mutationem this year too. I've played ha Haro Halibut this weekend. Uh, I'm trying to play more and more games. I think it's... Uh, First off, I love games, of course. Why? Where else are we making it? But I think a lot of, you know, uh, devs kind of get complacent in playing other games, because you like you play them and you go, "Oh, this is such a good idea. I should work on my game." <laughs> yeah, that happens way too often, and that and you know lack of time and. But mostly, I think it's like the, the difficulty of playing a game and not working on your project. But I think. Overall, it's a better thing not, you know, not to think like that and to actually play games because cause it really benefits you as a creator. But, it, you know, it's a, it's a great thing. It reminds you that other games can be fun and, you know, you can work on your game at a later time. Um, so I'm one played? of those devs. I was going <laughs> to say I'm one of those devs that James is complaining about. I Oh, Mostly, Horizon I Zero just Dawn games. I also played, which Mark has technically played by proxy, but go ahead. Yeah, Mark. so I was going to say, I don't play much uh, other than Fallen Gods um, anymore, but I play games with my kids. I have a 14-year-old and a 12-year-old daughter, um, and my younger daughter got really into Horizon based on James's recommendation. My kids have known James indirectly for basically their entire lives um my young older daughter was four months old when we started primordia um and then my younger daughter was born during primordia's development and so yeah when james recommended horizon um both my daughters had really liked um uh breath of the wild mm -hmm. and he said it, it was a similar type game and so my younger and i played it together with me being like a spotter basically while she played um, my older daughter plays fortnite so i watch her play that um and then really the only game that i've played a lot of recently on my own is this game called shogun showdown um which was on a 
free game on itch and now there's a game it, now it's a commercial game on steam it's like a fairly mindless but very satisfying um you played by survivor still uh, i did yeah that was the same kind of thing these games that are just sort of like easy to turn your brain off for for a while um <laughs> are kind of a welcome break from game dev and from my game day job I I think I've run out of open world games this year. I forgot I played Red Dead Redemption 2, <laughs> played uh, Forbidden West 2, played God of War the reboot. Uh, I think I'm running out of open world games. Uh, but I like the open world uh, genre as a thing because it's like kind of nice to be able to explore and level up your character as you go. It's a, it's a great genre, I think. I'm enjoying it, at least. Okay, now we can uh, move on to the meat and potatoes of this interview. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, Mark and James, like, I don't know, just throwing, just like spitballing here. If, like, say, hypothetically, you were like, uh, like on a Discord call at some sort of video game interview show with some sort of eccentric host and they were going to ask you about what strange land is like what would be the elevator pitch you would like give like what's the elevator pitch whenever you like whenever you're at some sort of game promoting event oh uh well usually how i describe strange land is like silent hill 2 meets it's a wonderful life the the movie by frank capra mm -hmm. uh because i think while like Silent Hill, I think is a very it's a much sadder and you know psychological horror kind of uh, story. Uh, I don't think Strangeland, while it has like those things, it's psychological horror in a sense, and it's kind of dark. That that's not the the goal of the game. I think the goal of the game is to uplift players, even though that doesn't seem like it is initially. Uh, and I think, you know, It's a Wonderful Life is a great movie and I think it shares some similarities to 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 Strangeland in a way. Even though Mark has never played Silent Hill 2, which is uh, a cardinal sin for which he will repent, I'm sure, at some point in time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I don't know if he has seen It's a Wonderful Life. I hope... In yeah. my heart of hearts. Okay, good. Okay, we got one out of two. <laughs> That's good. I've never, I've dreaded to ask this whole time. Um, but I think that's that's the thing. Um, but, uh, you know, Mark designed it and wrote it, and I'm sure he has more to say on, you know, what came to be. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think if I were trying to compare it to another game, Sanitarium would probably be the one I would first reference because it's a point and click adventure, it's horror, it's involved, you're inside someone's mind. All of those things are true of Strangeland as well. Um, you know, one of the things that we really wanted to do with Strangeland is find a way to retain. Um, the core elements of a point and click adventure, including challenging puzzles, but trying to remove a lot of the things that can be frustrating for a player. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, so just to give some examples, like there's an integrated hint system that's like an in game, in character hint system. Uh, you can move instantly out of any room by double clicking on an exit. Uh, you can die, but death doesn't end your game You because you're trapped in this kind of loop in your own mind, so you respawn when you die. Um, inventory management. I think inventory puzzles are an integral part of point-and-click adventures, but in, we always thought it was kind of cumbersome how you would get into an inventory and use an item, so we came up with this mouse wheel approach for letting you change your selected item more quickly um and we you know we just wanted wherever we could to build on the foundation of the classic games that we really loved not streamline or simplify them but try to get through the things that you know frustrated us that i saw frustrated my kids when i played point click adventure games with them um so that the player's time was spent 
struggling with puzzles, not struggling with an interface or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of I don't have a, an elevator pitch for the game other than to say, um, you know, it, it, it is a game where uh, it, the puzzles are symbols and the symbols fit together in a larger puzzle of the protagonist's self-understanding. Um, it's not a game with a big twist. Uh, you know, you know right from the very first moment that the protagonist's wife has died um, and that he can't save her. Uh, you find that out in the, the very first instant. Uh, and some of the, some players have said, you know, they get into the game and there's no twist and they're surprised there's no twist. It really isn't that um, that kind of a, a discovery where you discover that an assumption that you had throughout the game was false. It's more about um, just a very close, intimate look at the protagonist's grief and how that grief has manifested his coping mechanisms in his mind and things like that. Um, and, you know, this leads into the, the next question that I know you wanted to ask about where the game came from and what its, its inspiration was, um, which is uh, not long before, uh, you know, I had the idea for the project, my grandmother and step-grandfather both died, and my grandmother had been suffering from dementia for many years and slowly losing all her memories. Uh, as I mentioned before, my step-grandfather was a NASA engineer and really believed that there was a solution for this problem that could be engineered. And so um, he really had tried to find ways to give her a structure to her life um, that would help you know, when you're suffering from dementia, having a schedule can make it easier um, for you not to get confused. He organized the physical space of their apartment. They had moved from a, a house to an apartment, ultimately to a, a nursing facility. And the, at the last stop, it was a small space. And he had really laid it out in a way that as she navigated that space, there would be these physical, tangible reminders of the important things in her life. Um, her academic um, career, trips they had taken, her family, her grandkids, her, her daughters, and her son. Um, and anyway, um, it was hard for me when they, they died. Um, it was the last of my grandparents. And I had been asked to be the, uh, not really the executor, but the um, you know, essentially all of their, you know, any assets they had left were given to uh, a scholarship program at RPI. But all of the, like, things that they had, just like knickknacks, um, my grandfather had asked that I go through and make sure that they all got sent to people who would, who would be the right family members to get it. And so... That I had no idea that that was coming. Uh, I found out, you know, my my grandmother died, and just a couple weeks later, my grandfather died, and it was quite clear that the only thing he had been living for was to take care of her. Um, and once that was done, he was just ready to, you know, let go of his burden and and pass on. Um, and anyway, I then find out that I've got this this job to do, and went out and went into the apartment and saw this space that had been set up as like a mnemonic structure. So, you know, one way, if someone's like a really good rememberer, but I've, my understanding is that what they do is they construct in their mind what's sometimes called a memory palace or memory cabinet, where you've actually visualized physical things associated with memories you want to hold on to, mm -hmm. dates or addresses and things like that. This was basically a physical uh, instantiation of that mental construct. And as I walked 
walked through it, you know, there were his, um, you know, his published papers on neuronautics, there were her work on genealogy and sociology, there were photos of me and my kids and my brother and his kids and my mom and my aunt and my uncle, uh, my wedding, their wedding, and it, it was really an intensely affecting experience of realizing that there are these physical, tangible things that are tied very much to memories. And so I had this idea uh, as a way of coping with the grief I was feeling about that I you know, would design an adventure game um, that would be about the mental, physical space uh, by which the protagonist um, processes his grief and his memories of a loved one that he had lost. Um, and because this was, you know, my grandfather grieving and losing his, his wife, that was, you know, I wanted to be a, a husband and a wife. Um, and the idea was that we were just going to do this for like a three-day adventure game competition. But as we started getting into it, um, I think we all became very personally invested in the project. Oh, no, no. They, they, they were both delusional on that end. They said, this is an adventure game. And I said, and I remember it vividly, I said, I'm going to clear up my schedule for the next four years. And here we are. <laughs> Yeah, no, it wound up, you know, it kept growing and getting more complicated. Um, and really, I think, ended up being, you know, from from my standpoint, from the story and design standpoint, um, not just about my grandparents, but also about love and despair and grief and various feelings that I've had throughout my life, um, you know, uh, as a husband and a father and a son and all those things. Um, Primordia was already a very personal game for me, uh, and I know it was for James too, uh, and for everyone who participated in the project. Um, but, you know, Strangeland was also very personal in that way. Uh, and, you know, it was nice in the sense that, uh, you know, I had this, uh, my my grandfather had always been very interested in um, in the games I would develop. He sometimes would test them. He would send me articles and stuff that he thought it would be helpful uh, for the projects I was working on. Stuff about you know Norse mythology, with not for fallen gods, science fiction stuff for Cloudscape, and, and um, anyway. Uh, so it was nice to be able to make this uh, sort of homage to my grandparents um anyway that was how it got started and obviously when you start making a game at some point it can't just be about your feelings you actually have to make a fun game but that mm -hmm. was the kicking off point of that okay <clears throat> and you know with that in mind i know this is a bit of a slightly unexpected question but have either of you two ever played the psychonauts games Oh, yes. I have, yes. Because, when, <clears throat> like, I've played through, I've played through the first one several times and played through the second one, you know, the year it came out, and, like, I noticed, like, and I'm not sure, like, intentionally, but, like, some parallel, since, like, as you said, this world <clears throat> it was, like, and very overt, like, metaphor for grief the main character is feeling in it. And it reminded me of how, like, 99.9% .9 of, like, the levels in Psychonauts are you literally, like, going into a person's head and, <clears throat> like, essentially just, like, punching... Like, a manifestation of with their inner demons, not necessarily to, like, make them go away forever, but to make it so that it's not, like, eating their brain. Like, I... <clears throat> now that I'm thinking about it, I remember in the, f like, the first game, uh, you meet Gloria, who is, uh, a state, a, like, a famous on-stage star, and, like, 
Like, in the game, you find, like, the mental vaults, and it shows you, like, gives you more insights into the characters, and we find out she was, like, sent to academies as dance, and we figure out that, like, her mom was jealous of her daughter's success, and either through that or unrelated reasons, like, took her own life, and as a result, like, Gloria began to suffer from, I'm not sure if it's bipolar disorder necessarily, but, like, extremely violent mood swings, and when you go into, like, the level that is her head, you, like, actually have to, you basically have to, like, fight manifestations of, like, all of her insecurities and all the crap she's gone through between now and then, and, like, how, like, a lot of Psychonauts is like that. Like, even, like, in Psychonauts 2, most of the minds you go into are people who are, like, you know, a fair bit older than the characters of, like, Psychonauts 1, like, adults who are, like, either at or past, like, middle age, and you see them... And when you go into, like, their minds, you see, like, manifestations of, like, stuff they've been dealing with for a long time. And you know, that's kind of where my head was at was, like, as I was playing through Strangeland. I think, uh, I don't think that's a, that's a wrong assumption. Though I do think that uh, Psychonauts always ground the, the narrative to not, you know, uh, dissuade from, from, you know from the cartoony style. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do think that a game that kind of um, does what... Si uh, that, 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 oh, sorry. That is between Strangeland and Psychonauts is uh, What Remains of Edith Finch. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've played that one, but it's like... Not yet. You get... It's like you're given... Um, you go into this house that is full of memories of people that have passed... Uh, you know, have passed away. And you explore every room, and every room has like uh, memorabilia of sorts, and like you know, it's it's how the game is constructed. But you essentially get to live like everybody's experience as they like uh, their last moments, and more importantly, their lives. And uh, in that aspect, I think it's it's kind of like that game is kind of the bridge between Strangeland, where Strangeland is like more serious and and. Uh, and Psychonauts, while alluding to all these dark themes, doesn't, you know, um, focus on them and keeps the game kind of cheery, but, like, still there's dark undertones. Mm -hmm. uh, what remains of Edith Finch is, like, in between, where it's, like, you know, you get to see all that, but essentially I think the point of all these games is that, you know, um, you can't just give up. I don't think any of these games has any defeatist... Um, mentality to them psychonauts definitely doesn't neither does strangeland and neither does uh, what remains of edith finch yeah so but, I, I would just say oh go ahead sorry no no i was i was not going <laughs> go ahead so uh i love psychonauts so it is definitely the case that uh it would have had an influence on me one of the things in particular that I love about Psychonauts and consider like um, very much my own philosophy when it comes to telling stories and making games it is all of the characters are treated with a lot of dignity. Mm -hmm. um, initially, they all seem ridiculous. The character designs are quite cartoonish <laughs> and caricature. Yep. If your first exposure to them is they're just blowhards or, you know, Rin and Stimpy cartoon type characters. And, and then as it's peeled back, um, like, you stop laughing and start crying at a certain point. I mean, maybe you don't actually start crying, but like, uh, these, these elements are really used to disarm you. Um, and get you know get you to engage with these darker themes as james says without the game itself feeling super dark um the other thing that i thought psychonauts does quite beautifully is I, i've not played the second one but the first one at least um setting aside some of the collection aspects of the game but even including some of the collection aspects like the gameplay and the narrative integrate very nicely. 
so that the abilities that you're using, the obstacles that you're facing, tend to be reinforcing um, the thematic content of the game. The one place is, I think it starts to break down a bit as the game goes on. So my view is uh, until Lungfishopolis, it is an almost perfect game. From Lungfishopolis on, it has a number of phenomenal moments, but doesn't hang together perfectly. And I, I did not particularly like uh, the ending of the game. It felt like the symbols were a little bit more in your face and a little bit less nuanced than they had been elsewhere. But yeah, I would say, uh, you know, from an adventure game standpoint, Sanitarium is certainly one that had a big influence. From an overall gaming standpoint, Psychonauts had a strong influence too. Um, I always liked, what was his name, Ollivander, the, the like general guy? Is Oleander, that... yeah. Oleander, yeah. I like that character a lot. I <laughs> thought he was very nicely done. Um, uh, I sometimes, when I used to coach uh, my daughter's soccer team, I would use, like, he had some, like, you guys are like molasses flowing uphill in the winter. Kind of, uh, <laughs> uh, I occasionally call him that. <laughs> Great game. Okay. And um, what made you decide to like was like having Strange Land be a, like a point and click, like always like a part of it from like like the game's initial like conception as an idea, or did you decide that having it be a point and click would just like make sense with like the sort of story and gameplay you were going for? Uh, well, we had definitely always imagined it as a point and click you know in part because it was for this game competition and uh we had done point and click before with primordia so it was something we were familiar with and thought we could do on a you know short time frame um but you know i, I definitely feel like uh, you kind of like like stories and narrative themes kind of have to fit the gameplay and that was you know i think it, like if you're gonna tell a, a story about uh, like a awesome like badass gunman pro I, i've always thought this is like one of the challenges of the game jim and i Rue, which is a, a really good game but like an adventure game is a little bit of an odd um genre for for that kind of a character uh, i think there's a reason why like a lot of the classic adventure games you have these relatively dorky uh loner types as the protagonists and you know for here where um we knew it was going to be sort of about a a character uh, figuring himself out that the adventure game structure would work pretty well for that, that the puzzles would, would work pretty well as a, you know, a, a way of paralleling the things that the protagonist himself was sorting through. Um, but, you know, I, I don't know. I, I probably made a picture it having been anything other than an adventure game. Okay. Um... Um, like, I'm not a video game type person, nor am I involved, really involved in the entertainment industry at all, but, like, how would you say, how would you, like, compare the voice acting that was done for the game compared to, like, the voice acting done for, like, a movie or a TV show? Hmm, that's a great question. Um... I mean, I don't think, of course, they're comparable by any sort of way, but I don't think, I first off, I think performance-wise, uh, I think uh, Abe Goldfarb, who does uh, all the Stranger Voices, has done a phenomenal job. Whether, like, I'm involved in the project or not, I think his work is is amazing. And, and he's... Uh, he he released the film uh, a few months ago 
So technically it is a TV film cast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there's a lot of people that, you know, uh, that uh, in our cast that have done things prior or after the game that are involving that. So I don't think that's... Um, like I don't I think the quality is comparable. I don't think it's that far off actually in retrospect. Uh, the production values are not the same like you know uh compared to a movie or a TV show. Uh but definitely I'll say that the entirety of the cast is not just like you know reciting lines they're actually acting them especially Abe uh the the mermaid the wife uh, honestly every role has you know uh, is doing something with what they have in terms of the you know the restrictions of the role and such uh, so i don't think it's that far off uh, i think abe should have gotten a bafta nomination it's uh, travis that he didn't but that's okay i think you know the game wasn't that popular but um and kind of niche given the genre, but I think Abe really nailed it. I was floored. And I had to listen to his lines three times to find typos or like misspellings or whatever. But uh, like, you know, to make sure that the text is, you know, uh, proper. But uh, yeah, that's that's what I think. I don't know if Mark has anything to, to say in that regard. So I think one difference is Although this is, um, there are, so, sorry, let me just back up a sec. There are different kinds of video game storytelling. So for instance, Horizon Zero Dawn has cutscenes that are basically like movie scenes. They're done, you know, with 3D graphics rather than live acting, but they might as well just be, you know, a Pixar cartoon or something. Their linear, um, like storytelling and using cinematic techniques. The games that we make aren't like that. Um, you know, James really tries to put as much of a cinematic feel into them as as possible, and I think on the graphics side, we've tried to do that too. But like, that's just not how the games work. The vast majority of the dialogue you hear in Strangeland is like one line when you click on an interaction and the character says I can't do that or you examine something and the character says this is what it is or you combine two items and the character says this is what I did or there's a dialogue but the dialogue you can pick whichever option you want to do in whichever order so the the units of dialogue are actually quite a bit more like monologue for mm -hmm. the most part or like just a back of oh, you know two line back and forth but there isn't the same flow of a conversation that you would have in a movie where you know if two characters talk for five minutes uh you would very much want those two actors in the studio together having that conversation with each other reading each other's you know t intonations and gestures and incorporating that into the voice acting when uh you know the stranger talks to the scribe uh under the yew tree like you don't need that and really couldn't utilize that because uh you have no way of predicting how the player will actually go through that conversation it's completely at the player's discretion even whether to ask most of those topics as a result, from a writing standpoint, uh, I would say there is more emphasis on making each line kind of be a one-liner, and that comes through in the acting as well. I think, um, you know, there is a, you know, each line gets a little bit heightened above a naturalistic delivery. The thing that the really great um, actors, who Dave Gilbert, who found the cast for both our games with, uh, that Watch Dive published, um, what he is able to do is, is get both that heightened kind of like uh, one-liner quality and a kind of intimacy 
out of the the acting and you really see that i think um in the game's quieter moments uh you see it sometimes in primordia from abe and from sarah elmale and uh you see it in in strangeland in particular from abe's delivery i think um like Abe's delivery in the second half of the game where he's playing basically every character, he obviously can't be having a, a conversation with himself and riffing off his own um, intonations. Each one of those, he's acting against Dave Gilbert up in the recording booth, and then you know Dave will play the counterpart, and both of those characters will ultimately be Abe in the game. But uh, you know some of those... It, lines are done with such um such depth that it feels more like a cinematic experience even though it's really just static characters standing straight vertical delivering you know their heads are bobbing up and down while they're talking uh the voice actors manage to bring it to life um in a way that you know we can't do with the animation um i think we had you know good talking animations but it's not like you know, a triple A game where you have all kinds of emotes and um, you know close ups and things like that. Mm, okay. And you know, from the time you initially thought of it to the time it was like released for all the world to buy, like how long did like the development of Strange Land ultimately take? Four years. I can, yeah, I think it was more than that. I think um, it's five. Um, yeah, I, let me see. I will, I will answer that for you right now because... Um, yeah. I think it's, to find it's definitely first. 2016 because that was when Until I Have You was released and I was on vacation before the release of Until I Have You, which was April 2016. So it was before that. It was like 2016, yeah. but like I think February or something. I could be wrong. So five years. Well, we just need to figure out what that competition was, right? And then we would uh, we could date it to that. But I think it was, yeah, I think it was about five years. I mean, we did um, we did other things in the middle um so like uh you know w i was working on fallen gods while we were doing it and i think i was working on torment tides of numenera too um let me see i found it's 2017 may 2017 is when i got yeah the... so, so it, it went uh, from four years uh, to prob almost to the day because it was released on the 21st of May. Uh, no, 20, 25th. 25th of May, yeah. So yeah, four years. Yeah. Four, uh, four years and five days. <laughs> Plus uh, whatever time was spent before I got the message. <laughs> <laughs> that was like 15 minutes. Okay. Okay, so that, that settles that. What a time. I knew it was not going to be done. In, 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 like, the same thing was said to me when uh, I joined uh, Primordia, because I joined a bit late. And it was like, we'll be done by summer. We were not done. Not even really. Yeah. So, I mean, with Primordia, um, yeah, it was our first time working together as a team, and we were still, like learning but it's also not you know none of us is like a conventional professional game dev in the sense that like you know we don't have some studio that we all go into and uh you know some uh like publisher paying us a salary or anything like that um you know we developed the games we had wanted to make the games and you know we were sharing in the back end of it but you know we were all juggling other stuff in our lives at the same time which i think slowed it down too yeah 
Okay. Now we get to the final question of the interview, which I trust is perfectly understandable to everyone who's ever been on this show. Uh, James and Mark, in your opinion, is video games? Sorry, what was the question? Is video games. It is not a typo. Like, is video games? Yeah, it's, I've come to realize that as I, the more I ask this question, the more it's like an, a Rorschach test where the answer says more about the person than the question itself. <laughs> so is video games a thing? I would say definitely is. Uh, is video games dying? I don't think so, even though a lot of people think seem to think so sometimes. I don't think I don't think they are. Um, I think video games are a great medium because it's like an interactive, uh, creative work, and um, I don't think it's going anywhere. Unlike so Pokemon, I'm gonna I'm gonna read the ink blot differently. <laughs> I think the question is asking, um, is something that you just watch games? And to me, the answer is absolutely not. This is the the, the beauty of um, computer games, video games, is the interaction and the agency of the player. There's a reason why um, video game stories have the impact they do, despite the fact that if you read like the Wikipedia summary of them, you think like, God, this is barely like a second rate Saturday morning cartoon show. But when you play the game, um, it becomes a part of your life. And the reason is because you are immersed in it. You're the one driving the action. And uh, and you create this, this connection with the game, with the developer of the game, with the other people who played the game um, that can exist uh, only okay. through it being a game. So video is not games. Uh, games rely on agency of the player and the interaction of the player with something that a creator created and in that space of interaction is where the video games exist and I, and I think a lot of games you know uh, uh, transcend that in a, in a great way I think it's important for a game to have that something you know like that that extra piece that it's not just a constructed game that is made meant you know made to make you know money but it's more like something that has something to say whatever that is it doesn't have to be something i agree with okay and with that we can bring this particular episode of the pumpkin copter cast to a close i would like to thank james and mark for joining me and talking to me about strange land which for those of you interested uh you can do what i did and buy it on steam where is you know of Available on, you know, PC and Mac for fourteen ninety nine in American monies and whatever the equivalent of fourteen ninety nine is in what non American monies. <laughs> <clears throat> and yeah. Um Thank you so much for having us. You're welcome. Uh the it was developed by the good peoples at Warmwood Studios, and it was published, as you've said, by Waja Eye Games, who, you know, I've just been... Like, if, if someone ever... Like, if a, a big wig executive from a big video game company says something like, point and clicks are dead, you can, you know, just show them Waja Eye Studios and, like, prove them as, as wrong as they were when they said survival horror was dead and then Resident Evil 7 came out. And, yeah, uh, before we sign off, is there anything you two would like to shamelessly promote? I see you. Uh, yeah, we're working on a hugely amazing game called uh, Fallen Gods. It's a roguelite. 
uh, that is very narrative focused, kind of like like Road Warden meets uh, more narrative, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're hoping to release uh, in 2025, I'd like to say. Um, but yeah, it's we've been working. I mean, Mark has been working on it for 10 years. I've been working with him on it for three. Uh, oh, it's time passes. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, but uh, we're really excited for it. And we're hoping that it's it's like different from point and click, but it still has that same um, uh, feel of like, you know, games of old that, you know, uh, um, what's the word that you know uh, focus on the player experience more than you know uh, anyway the game has tons of heart i like to believe and i think it, it's gonna be something people like even though it's very different from a point and click adventure game okay and you know after you're done buying strange land for your computer if you have any money left over you can go to patreon.com slash the pumpkin copter cast which is you know how i fund some of the fun the appearances of some of the guests here and for as little as a dollar a month you can you know submit questions for me to use in future episodes and if you're one of my negative seven viewers who watch this show on youtube uh you can go ahead and sub Leave it a like and subscribe, and yeah, and like if and if any other like game developers are out there, and you want some free publicity from someone who is always desperate to talk to anyone in the like, game industry and game development space. Hi, I'm the host of the Pumpkin Copter Cast, and I will, I will like shill for pretty much any game that doesn't have any sort of horrible practices and you know which ones i'm talking about so until next time everyone this has been the pumpkin copter cast and as i say at the end of every show have a gourd day everyone